Hi, Brother Richard. Today we're look, looking at a lesson, second in the series, and I titled Eternal Life. This is part two. And in this particular context, we're comparing eternal life with temporal life. Similarities and the differences. The first principle that we come across is that Scripture teaches temporal life is experienced through the senses and is maintained by the operation of what's called the breath of life. Eternal life is experienced in the things we see, hear, taste, smell, and see. Turn to the book of Genesis, second chapter, verse 7. Genesis, the second chapter, verse 7, we see the initial introduction of man and how he functions. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So, the breath of life which was administered through the nostrils, <clears throat> gave man the vitality, the ability to experience life in the senses, physical life. <clears throat> as soon as he was imbued with the breath of life, he immediately became animate, put on his feet, and began to experience things McConnell perspective. Bring that to the soul. We consider the body. Life of the soul is different. Excuse me, are you saying the breath of life is considered the body? Yeah. Breath of life is what animates your body. Yeah. That's why it says man became yeah. a nafish, a physical breathing being. Before right. that, he wasn't. Uh, soul became Soul is to see the personality. Yeah. Yeah. Spirit. Oh, spirit. Spirit. The spirit is not the best no. um, The spirit is a vitality that gives the soul its ability to exist. The breath of life is what gives the full triune essence of man, the ability to exist. That's why we come to the next principle. Scripture teaches the life of the senses was never meant to be permanent. From Genesis, the third chapter, verse 19. Genesis 3, verse 19. Is that a lesson for Ishmael? Yeah. <laughs> Genesis 3, verse 19. The Lord explains what man is. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou returns unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So, the life of man through the breath of life was never meant to be permanent. Whether it's sin or not, he would still have gone back to the earth. Everything in the physical realm dies. If man had not sinned, what purpose would he have served before he went back to the earth? Oh, he would have... <laughs> been inaugurated into a, a grand scheme for the planet. He's meant to be a custodian over the things of the earth to bring forth, make it fruitful, make it multiply. Man would have been a race that would have dominated the earth for the Lord in an ingenious way. And he passed it on to his descendants until the time 
that this creation would go out of existence. So the Father's master plan still would have worked without Adam going into sin? No. No. It had to, he had to sin mm. for the Father's master plan to come into effect. So then it's not possible for him to be in a situation where he wouldn't have sinned. That would be, that would be part and part. Well, something else would have happened, yeah. It might not have been Adam, because he would have generated a race, and later on, the next generation, mm -hmm. have, you know, yeah. Satan wouldn't have given up right. if he missed the first time. But God knew that Adam The reason I'm, 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 I'm throwing this out a little bit, forgive me for a second. It's okay. Because it begins to sound as if this was part of humanity being expendable. Is that a fair statement to make? Sure. Yeah. Man was created for the fall. Vision being that Satan wasn't just completely stopped. Right. He was he was set limits. Yeah. He's much. he's but uh, he still had the temptation to be able to tempt the world at the sin. Certainly. Because that was the master plan, so man had to lose it. Certainly. Uh Satan is what under what you might call house arrest from its fall. That's he's not turned are totally in prison. He's free to be able to create evil and the conditions which draws this man closer to God. Exactly. He's saying, well, God does all things wisely. You know, so you can look at that like to make people sin, help them draw up to be closer. Yeah. Once we really love God, we out. Exactly. Mm. Who's going to be faithful and who isn't? Let's go on. <clears throat> we see that the life of the senses was never meant to be permanent. Turn to Psalms 146, verses 3 to 4. One forty six verses three to four. And there. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man in whom there is no help. So don't put your your dependence upon this world, the world system, or the people of this world. Because if you do, you're going to be disappointed. Man will fail you every single time. This is what the scripture is saying. One, verse four. His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth, and that very day his thoughts perish. So man is a temporary being. He is not in a position to guarantee stability because he's not stable himself. The things that man does are unstable. There's never been one society that's endured for any protracted period of time. Every society that man enters into falls. Every government falls. Because why? Because man basically is not capable of permanent endurance in the state that he's in, in a fallen state. And we want to take a look at that in these next passages of Scripture. Scripture teaches the life of the senses is lived in subjectivity, interacting with things as they appear to be, not as they actually exist. Man sees things subjectively. He cannot see things as they are. He sees things as they appear to him. That's why everything is constantly changing in man's prerogative, in man's world. The way man sees things is ever changing. There's never a continuing, continuing stability about anything dealing with the human race. Why? Because man can't see endurance. Man can't see stability. All man sees is what he appears to see. The senses 
are not designed for objective evaluation. The senses are designed for subjective evaluation. Two people can see the same thing and have two different responses to it because they see things subjectively. So the proverb, the 14th chapter, verse 12. Last week, as Brother Cope used to say, too true. <clears throat> Proverbs 14, verse 12. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Every system you read, you see, man enters into is an illusionary system. You take a look at the communist belief system. It's a proven fallacy. Yet, and still, every generation that follows that consistently believes in it. They think it's going to work. Every belief on the face of the earth is fallacious, is, is, is illusionary and changes. But yet, and still, men continue to accept that belief system. Islam, these guys are going out blowing themselves up, believing a lie. I was looking at this thing the other day about the uh, World War II <clears throat> mentality of Japan. They've lived under a system called Bushido, which teaches a certain lifestyle based off of uh, servitude. Uh, <clears throat> in the ancient times, Japan was a feudal system and the Lord uh, was, his, his edicts were inviolate. He was followed regardless uh, to be adhered to. And they incorporated that into the society in World War II. So when Japan started losing the war, uh, they began to, uh, I think this propaganda device, which uh, was called, um, Makokura means um, willing to sacrifice. And that's where the kamikaze mentality came from. These young men would uh, climb into a plane, bomb laden, and go out and dive into a ship, believing that by their death, they would become gods. All societies are Luciferian in origin. They, they, deal, they deal with illusion. The only society that ever existed on the face of the earth that dealt in reality was the society of Israel, God's society, the old covenant society dealt with truth. But of course, men didn't want to cling to that. They wanted uh, society of the people around them. So we find scripture teaching the life of the senses is lived in subjectivity. The next principle, scripture teaches eternal life is imparted by the Lord Jesus to those who enter into a relationship with him. Eternal life is imparted by the Lord Jesus to those who enter into a relationship with him. Turn to 1 John, 5th chapter, verses 11 and 12. 1 John, 5th chapter, Verses 11 and 20. <clears throat> and this is the record that God have given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. So we find that the scripture gives us in no uncertain terms the understanding 
But eternal life, permanent life, can only be found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn to the Gospel of John, 10th chapter, verse 27 to 23. Right there. Gospel of John, 10th chapter, verse 27 to 28. We're talking about the difference between eternal life and temporal life. Temporal life is experienced totally by the senses. Eternal life is only experienced in the relationship with Jesus Christ. Gospel of John, 10th chapter, verse 27 to 28. Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow me, those that want to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So, he's saying, the person that has eternal life will never die. Now we find <clears throat> eternal life is imparted in the relationship with Jesus Christ. It started after his resurrection. It was imparted to the disciples first. Turn to the Gospel of John, 20th chapter, verse 21 to 22. Gospel of John, 20th chapter, verse 21 to 22. Here Jesus makes his appearance to the disciples in the upper room. Then said Jesus to them, Again, peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had thus said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. He breathed life, eternal life, unto those that were in his presence. This is the first instance of men receiving eternal life. What does that mean? It means that the first instance in which life would come into man. Those in the Old Covenant who are found righteous had life not within them. They had the Spirit of God dwelling with them. The presence was eternally to be with them, never in them. This only came about as a result of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Man now becomes capable of having eternal life dwelling within him. Eternal life is the spirit of life. Now, <clears throat> what we find, the difference between the spirit dwelling with a man and the spirit dwelling within a man is the difference between God looking at man as a servant and looking at him as a son. Next principle. Scripture teaches, it is the indwelling Holy Spirit of eternal life that prepares man for his place in heaven. Turn to the Gospel of John, 16th chapter, verses 13 to 14. The Gospel of John, 
16th chapter, verses 13 to 14. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. He shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So one of the Holy Spirit's ministries is to prepare the saint for life in heaven. How does he do that? By showing him truth, verity, showing him things as they actually are, preparing him to receive and understand the things of eternity, not the things of temporality. Because the things of temporality are passing away. The things of eternity are going to last forever. And the indwelling Holy Spirit within the saint enables him to experience eternal life. He goes on. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things in the Father hath of mine, therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and show it unto you. So the Holy Spirit's preparing the saint for the things of eternity. This is why Jesus said, if a man has eternal life, he shall never die. What does that mean? That means a temporal life is one day going to expire. Physical body is going to die. It was never meant to be permanent to begin with. And under the situation that we have now, it is corrupted. It's under a death sentence because of the fall of Adam and because of our own sins. Therefore, God doesn't use it. It's already been condemned. He's using the spiritual side of man which comes into being through the new birth in which the Holy Spirit indwells that life. That's the only thing he's dealing with. That's why you won't hear God speaking to you in an audible voice, although sometimes he does. And those that he does speak to are those who are within his relationship sphere. He will deal with the saint through the spirit, not through the carnal, because the carnal has been condemned. We're going to turn to Romans 8. Romans 8 to me is a um, passage that gives you a, an exciting picture of the things of God's master plan, the things of eternity. We're going to start with Romans 8, verses 7 to 8. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. For then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. God doesn't operate through the carnal mind. Because the carnal mind acts as an enemy, in opposition, stands in opposition to God, God's will, God's way, because it's been corrupted by the Luciferian influence that runs this world. So as far as God is concerned, the only way he'll deal through the carnal mind is if that mind has been brought into subjectivity to the spirit totally. It's totally a yielded vessel. In other words, if the mind has been regenerated, by the Holy Spirit and renewed by the Holy Spirit, then the individual is in a position to be open to the things of God. But that's only going to take place with an individual that's in an advanced stage of maturity in Christ. You're not going to operate through a baby Christian. Now you're in Romans 8, turn to verse 11. Drop down to verse 11. 
But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwell in you. In other words, eternal life that's dwelling in the saints is in the person of the Holy Spirit who is imparting life to the new creation. That life that's being imparted through the Spirit is animating, activating the new creation to greater and greater states of maturity and understanding the things of God. It is the Spirit in us that enables us to give the ability to experience eternal life. Notice what the scripture said. Verse 9, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of you. You have the spirit dwelling in you, then you don't belong to the family of God. Now this is important for us to understand, because you have people sitting in church that think they're Christians from biblical perspective and they're not. They've never been regenerate, they've never been born again, they've just been in church all their life. And they've never been taught what the biblical definition of a Christian is. You're talking here about the majority of Christian professing people. I tell this story of a woman that we met at the nursing home that we go to every other week who was there because she had a problem. I think she broke her leg or something like that. And she was convalescing, and we were asked if we'd go in and pray for her. And we went in and we were talking to her, and she came come out of the Methodist church. And she began to say about her experiences as a Methodist and her forebears, in other words, a whole line of her family were Methodists in high positions in the Methodist church. And so I was led to ask her, how long have you been a Christian? And she says, well, I've always been in the Methodist church. And I knew she didn't have a clue about what a Christian was from a biblical perspective. And then a letter to uh, the Gospel of John, third chapter, verse three to five, where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, he says, unless you be born again, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And to her, that was a revelation. And I began to ex explain to her a little bit about the born again, the new birth experience in Christ. You have to be <clears throat> born again supernaturally by God to be brought into the body of Christ. And so after I got through explaining to her, I said, do you want to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior and be born? Yes, she did. And she was led to the Lord. But it was a revelation to her. Most people are not Christians, don't believe they are. You turn on TV on a Sunday, you listen to some of the watered down messages that are given to people. The, the people believe that everybody sitting under there preaching is a Christian. And therefore, that they are participants in whatever it is, the message. That they're given. What we just read in the scripture. If you don't have the Spirit of God dwelling in you, you're none of Him. As far as God is concerned. And that has some heavy implications because if the person doesn't have the Spirit of Christ in them, they're not going to be quickened. And when they leave this life, it's all that's all for them. There is no eternal life in them, therefore they can't experience eternal life when they pass this temporal line. But let's go on. The Holy Spirit is given in two stages. In the first Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, verses 16 to 17. First Thessalonians, fourth chapter, Verses 16 to 17. This is the ultimate destiny 
of those who are open and yielded to the Holy Spirit. First Thessalonians four, sixteen to seventeen. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, I want you to focus on the word caught up. This is a function of the Holy Spirit that's indwelling the saint. It's a phrase used by everybody that comes under a move of the Holy Spirit. Philip was caught up after he led the eunuch to Christ and brought over to a city miles away. It's the Holy Spirit that will change. We read in Romans 8, he will quicken your mortal body by his spirit that dwells in you. The Holy Spirit will take the corrupted body that he indwells and will change it to a state of incorruption in divinity. And then, in dwelling that body, he will catch it up to the presence of the Lord in the air, and the Lord will take all the saints to the presence of the Father to present them as completed sons of God. Now, we said that the Holy Spirit is going to experience in two stages. The first stage, you receive the Holy Spirit through the new birth process, and it's called the earnest of the Spirit. Turn to 2 Corinthians, 5th chapter, verse 5. Second Corinthians, fifth chapter, verse five. Now he that had wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. What does the word earnest there mean? Well, in the vernacular, it means down payment. It means that in the new birth, the Holy Spirit is imparted to us in a portion not in his fullness. And when he is imparted to the saint, he begins to operate in the life of the saint, bringing the saint to a state of maturity and preparing him for the time in which he will operate in the life of the saint in his fullness. Turn to Second Corinthians, First chapter, verse 21 to 22. Noting the term earnest of the Spirit. Second Corinthians, first chapter, verse 21 to 22. Now he which established us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God, referring to the Father, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. When you become regenerate, when you become born again, when you accept Jesus as first Lord and Savior, God performs a supernatural act of creation, making you a son of God. The Holy Spirit of life enters into you and takes up residence with your spirit, making a new creation. 
he does not enter into the saint in his fullness. He enters into the saint is in a measure called the earnest, the down payment, the first portion. Now, turn to the book of Ephesians. Scripture teaches at the rapture, the saint will receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians, the first chapter, verse 12 to 14. Yes. He gets more of the fullness of the portion, the down payment of the Spirit. We all have that down payment we tap into. Exactly. Is the, sorry, is the glorification process to receive the rest? Is the glorification process what? When you receive the rest of that down payment. Ephesians, the first chapter, verses 12. <clears throat> Anyone there? We should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Of course, Paul is referring to the new birth. In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, ye were sealed with that holy spirit of promise. You were given the earnest of the spirit as part of the new birth experience. which is the earnest of our inheritance, the down payment, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. When is the purchased possession redeemed? <coughs> At the rapture. Then you get the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Anybody that is able to experience the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Turn back to Romans 8. Verse 22 to 23. Eight, verse 22 to 23. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Well, let's talk about the state of corruption of the physical creation. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, earnest, the down payment of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body, waiting for the change in which we receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. That point is called the adoption where we are taken in as fully adopted sons of God. Yes. The people who miss the rapture, mm -hmm. when do they get their fullness? They don't. Ever. Right. So they only operate with the down payment, yeah. Right. Eternally. Right. You were the saints who die in the tribulation, don't get the fullness. That's right. That's right. They do not become adopted. Turn, you're in Romans 8. We want verses 14 to 17. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. 
But you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. When the Holy Spirit enters into us during the new birth experience, he comes in as the spirit of adoption. His job is to prepare us for the time in which we will be fully adopted sons of God at the rapture. So until the rapture happens, every one of us who's born again and has received the earnest is indistinguishable from those who missed the rapture and sure. never ever received it. Sure. Is, that, is that right? Right. Everybody on the earth only has the earnest of the spirit. Nobody would receive the fullness. If they did, they'd be glorified. But let's go on. We have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The Spirit is preparing us for the time in which he will manifest in his fullness. And if children and heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. So only those that have experienced the sufferings of Christ are going to experience the glorification as an adopted son of God. Those that miss the rapture are going to have a degree of glory, but they're not going to experience the fullness of the Spirit. They're not going to be able to experience the fullness of eternal life as an adopted son of God. Turn to Galatians. Galatians, the fourth chapter. This is the essence and the quintessence of the purpose of God. Galatians 4, verse 4 to 7. When the fullness of the time was come, when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, what? to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption, that we might receive the adoption of son. This is what we're waiting for, the adoption. And because you're sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. It's the Holy Spirit indwelling us that enables us to call him Father. You don't have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. You cannot call him Father. He will not acknowledge you as his son. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. Servants were the old covenant saints. They had the Holy Spirit dwelling with them, but he was never dwelling in them. Therefore, they could not achieve that inner relationship as a son. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So what happened to uh, a years ago? There was a veteran or a teacher that in preaching or uh, leading the church you have a battle that you're fighting every single day the enemy is we are told is always looking for an opportunity to make an inroad into a person's thoughts he may have been leading his church for a long, long time, but we don't know what was going through his mind, what kind of battles he was fighting, what the degree of resistance was being broken down. That was only something he would know. And if he never was put himself in a position 
where he could confide or go to the Lord or receive aid, aid because a lot of times the person will believe because they're in a position of leadership, they can't show weakness because they'll undermine their position. So he might, we don't know, he might have been going through the motions trying to maintain a um, uh, um, an image of what a leader should be, but within he might be his resistance and resolve might have been broke being broken down consistently. We don't know. But it has all the earmarks of somebody ultimately giving in to a um, influence that had been dealing with them for a long period of time. Uh, would he have been like Moses, who made one mistake and uh, didn't go to the promised land? Well, he wouldn't be an overcomer, first of all. So he couldn't qualify to be. He might have been saved, he was saved through faith, but he wouldn't be considered an overcomer and then therefore uh, qualify for a rulership position in eternity. Wouldn't happen. Promises of the fullness of sonship only go to the overcomer. Now, a lot of times people are deceived into capitulating because they're fighting the battle in their own strength. Nowhere in the scripture are we instructed to be overcomers in our own strength. We are overcomers through him who strengthens us. You have the biggest problem that Christians have, the, the mistake of thinking they can do it without Christ at all times. Case in point, Peter. We were talking about that last night. Mm. I'll go with you all the way, Lord. No, you won't. The enemy is shrewd. Again, the person who does that is being worn down carnally with a carnal mind. Not spiritually, through uh, what the Father in Christ has given him. The enemy is shrewd, and that's why the scripture tells us that we have to be vigilant about what we're thinking about at all times, because the enemy will slip something into your thought stream subtly. You begin to uh, embrace it. Oh, Look at all the injustices coming your way. That's not fair. When you embrace that, you begin to go into a pity party. And before long, your defenses are being worn down. The scripture tells us, you always keep your shield up, but you can quench the fiery darts of the enemy. The enemy comes at you one of two ways. It come at you either through an, as an allure, making something attractive, or he'll come at you as a tormentor. Yeah. Depends on the, on the individual, but things like that don't happen overnight. We have the Holy Spirit in us to quicken us to all things. If you have a health problem, the scripture has a solution. It doesn't mean that everybody is always going to be cured of everything that they have. But what the scripture does tell us is that God will provide so that we can continue to mature spiritually. Every single person that's in the body of Christ has the promise of victory over every single problem that he'll ever face. Turn over to Revelation, the 21st chapter. <clears throat> what happens a lot of times is that the person doesn't continue to grow spiritually, to mature spiritually. Revelation 21, verse 7.
need to know of a comment. Every single promise in Revelation is preferenced by that, he that overcometh. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. That's the promise. Now, what the scripture also lets us know is we have a fight on our hands. We are expected to be vigilant. We are expected to be in God's word. And if we are open to the leading of the Lord, rather than the leading, remember we're talking about the carnal versus the spiritual. Your carnal thinking will give a solution to your problem too. That's why you have people that backslide and can justify their position in being backslidden. They get a rationale for what they're doing. Not the correct rationale, but they have a rationale. Uh, your mind will give you a solution to every experience you have that will justify it. A mass murderer justifies his crime in his own mind. If we submit to God's will, we say, God, God your will be done, we automatically should be able to overcome. If we're willing to do that, but in order to do that, we have to reach a stage where we're willing to put ourselves down to do it. Because your mind will fight tooth and claw before it will release you to the point where you'll say, thy will be done, not my will. That takes a fight to reach that point. That means we have to mortify our own desires, our own flesh, our own way of seeing things, so that we're submissive to God's way of seeing things. And when we do that, and then God is uh, in a position to give us victory over every single problem we have. The problem that man has, again, is Proverbs, the 14th chapter that we read. There's a way that seemeth right unto a man. You have people that will fight you to the bitter end, believing that what they do, what they say, what they see, is the true way to do it. And it you know, you have people coming up to you and say, why are you a Christian? How are you going to ever get anything out of life being a wimp? You can't enjoy anything. Walmart. <laughs> 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 we, we can't do anything more than ask God to take over, can we? No. But it's reaching a point where we ask God to take over. <laughs> means that you got to fight to reach that point because your mind yeah. wants to do it its way. Yeah. Your mind wants to tackle the problem and solve the problem its way. People have pride. People have a degree where they say, you know, uh, Lenin, the guy that formed the Communist Manifesto, talked about Christians. He said, Christians, we use their Christianity as a crutch. Yes, we do because we know we can't do it in our strength, in our way. I'm, I'm walking on a crutch all my life. I'll be walking on a crutch till I leave this place, gladly walking on a crutch. My crutch is called Jesus Christ. Yeah, and he says, turn the other cheek, turn the other cheek. Yeah, it doesn't mean, though, that you have to be a wimp. No. Oh, uh-uh. No. So I can throw a punch every now and No, <laughs> no, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. I'm, I'm right. uh, I know, but spiritual. You use wisdom when you turn the other cheek. Yes. Because Satan will use that to make you a wimp and a carpet for somebody to walk over. No, that doesn't mean that you roll over for some situation. It means that the Holy Spirit will give you the wisdom to be submissive in a situation in which God will change the circumstances. It says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So somebody does us an injustice, we don't jump back and try to even the score. It means that we take it, knowing that God is watching, and God is going to take control and turn things around. And God is going to vindicate us, and God is going to be glorified to us. So what we find here, we are embarked on a path. I turn to the book of First John, third chapter. Sonship is the essence and the quintessence of the gospel message. Jesus came 
to give God sons. God wants sons patterned after his son. First John, third chapter, verse one to three. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. The world doesn't recognize you as the Son of God, but you are. Beloved, now, now, now are we the sons of God. Everybody that's in Christ has received the earnest of the Spirit is a son of God. Now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be adopted sons of God or what we are progressing toward. The fullness of <coughs> sonship, which comes with the fullness of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, but we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. I'm going to repeat that. Every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. The Holy Spirit will give us revelation knowledge of God's master plan. Is he preparing us for the fullness of sonship at a certain point? The Holy Spirit is going to quicken our mortal bodies and he's going to change us in the twinkling of an eye in which he cohabits with us in his fullness. That's what we're being prepared for. That's what we are undergoing experiences here for. That is why we fight and we war because you have an adversary that is out to make sure you don't make it. And he is pulling out every stop that he possibly can to try to make it happen. And the scripture tells us, you know, in certain terms, only a fraction of the, the call are going to make it. Only a fraction, a remnant, are going to experience the rapture. Majority of the body of Christ will not make it because the majority of the body of Christ is not going to be willing <coughs> to prepare itself for that instant in which it will happen. The twinkling of an eye. That's the time frame in which it happens. That's the time frame in which the door closes. If a person is not ready in that split second, they've lost it, they've missed it for eternity. Yes, they can still enter into glory as a son of God. Yes, they can still experience the glories of heaven, but not as an adopted son. They'll experience it on a lesser plateau of glory. 